Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is one more uh, series of lectures regarding the Athena European University Alumni Talks. We continue this week with an HMU alumni, alumni student. I will provide the floor to Professor Kaliakatsos in order to introduce the today's um, session speaker. Uh, the floor is yours, Yanis. Uh, okay, good evening, everybody. I'm very glad to have with us uh, Dr. Kostadinos Papastergiou from CERN. Kostadinos was one of, of my ex students around 20 years ago, I suppose. He was one of the best students in, uh, uh, during his studies. And then he continued uh, with postgraduate studies in uh, Edinburgh. And uh, after that, after he finished uh, his uh, PhD, he continued to for a postdoc and then uh, to work in the, in the industry in uh, ABB in Sweden. And finally, he came uh, to CERN where he's now an uh, uh, engineer working uh, with the, in, the, in the team of uh, uh, systems. Uh, I introduce and I would like to, to give the floor to Costas, to Pastor Gil, to continue. Thank you very much, Professor, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, it's very nice to be among so many um, distinguished uh, colleagues. And uh, I will um, present you today um, the perspective of a, of a power of, of a power electronics engineer um, that has been through a few uh, different uh, sectors of the power power electronics uh, business. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to. I, I have a few slides to show you to facilitate the discussion. And I will be uh, happy to answer any of your questions. You can interrupt me and uh, ask, ask me anything you like in, in the, dur during the presentation. So I will try now to share my slides. Right. Do you see the... You should make it full screen. Yes, now it's fine. You can go on. Thank you. Great. So as I said, it's uh, uh, my name is Kostas, Kostas Papastergiou. I'm in, uh, an engineer at CERN um, in the European Laboratory for Par Particle Physics in Geneva, Switzerland. And um, I have been asked to present my career so far. So I will uh, talk a little bit about the different stages I've been through. Uh, following my studies, and uh, I will gladly answer any of your questions, especially for the younger colleagues that are interested to know a bit more. So, uh, starting a little bit with my studies, um, of course, I have a background in electronic engineering. I studied in what was called Technical Education Institute of Crete at the time. Now it's the Hellenic Mediterranean University. I graduated around 2000. And uh, I remember very vividly that period when I was discussing with a lot of my professors, among them uh, Professor Kaliakatsos, um, about the different possibilities for, for uh, extending my studies. At the time, that was possible only abroad. And uh, that is what I did. So I had a couple of, a couple of offers at the time. And uh, I went, I remember, into the office of uh, Professor Kaliakatsos and asked him what, what his opinion would be. And one of them was the University of Edinburgh, uh, uh, and uh, of which Aristides is now a, a professor and uh, is, he's with us today. And he was, at the same time, my, um, how should I say, my senior. He was one year ahead, so I was kind of following. Uh, he was kind of a model. Uh, so uh, I had the luck to, to land in that university after uh, the, uh, Professor Kaliakatsos' encouragement also. He said, don't even think about any, any of the other offers. That is the university to go. 
And that's where I went for uh, what I started, started to be a master, actually, my master's program. And then uh, one year into the master's program, my professor said, why don't you continue for a PhD? And so a year later, I switched into a PhD uh, degree. That's nice that they have these kind of flexibilities in the universities in the, in the UK. In Scotland, in particular, I want to say the system is very similar to the Greek one. This, the studies last for four years if you want a bachelor's, and then you can do an extra year uh, to, to go into the master's degrees, very similar to the Greek, univers Greek Polytechnic University. And uh, so what I did, I obtained a, a degree at that, uh, at that time. The, um, uh, my, my thesis was on a contactless transfer of energy for a radar application in, in the uh, aerospace, or not aerospace, airborne uh, radar. So for a fighter aircraft uh, with uh, BAE systems in the UK. And um, then once I graduated there, I continued my studies with a small break that I will explain in a while uh, towards a post postdoctoral uh, research in the University of Nottingham, where I continue to work still in the um, aeronautics. And that time I worked on an on a environmental conditioning system, power supply for uh, an aircraft of Airbus, the, uh, an all-electric ele aircraft that was uh, a European project at the time. While uh, here I'm listing a few of my experience, or well, actually most of my experience, I started with my work experience with an internship in the National Telecom Organization, just like most of us that graduated from the Hellenic Mediterranean University. And then I continued, uh, I stayed for one year at the Greek uh, Hellenic Mediterranean University where I worked as a teaching fellow, uh, teaching assistant in the laboratory with Professor Bakatsakis, with Professor, uh, various professors in the, in the department. At, the, at that time, I was applying for my for continuing my studies, and I got the offer to to continue my studies. So then I left and went to the UK. After my PhD, I worked for about uh, two years on a startup that we started with a, a colleague following graduation from the PhD. Uh, started this company called Turnstone Devices. I will say a few words right after. And I also started a second startup because at the time I, I thought that um, that's the way to succeed. You may starting lots of companies and making lots of money. I thought that, that was that simple uh, and had a lot of dreams, of course. So uh, second startup, Mediterranean host, both of them in Scotland. But soon after I moved into the postdoctoral and following uh, the postdoctoral degree, I moved into Sweden where I um, did uh, work as a scientist in ABB corporate research. For those that are not aware, ABB is a company providing, uh, supplying electrical systems from the smallest electrical component, like a switch in, in your house, uh, all the way to large uh, transmission systems. And I was in the corporate research department, which is the department that looks into future technologies. We were not making products, but we were looking for what will be the, the technologies of the future, like 10 or 15 years ahead. And it was one of the most, the, probably the most interesting experience I had so far. And uh, since 2012, I'm with uh, uh, CERN in Geneva. Just Two very short comments, one very short comment about the uh, failures, important to try and to fail, I suppose, just like everybody says these days. I failed two times in that, uh, in two years, which was probably a little bit too much. But uh, the first one was with Turnstone Devices. That was a company that had as a mission to do engineering of wind turbine electronics, onboard electronics. At the time, we had the chance to, to work with a company in the wind, uh, a small company in the wind energy sector that was locally there in Edinburgh. So we got our first contract with them. We worked with them for about one and a half year. And then we realized that it's super difficult to do this job because 
you have to invest a lot of your time in hunting for the next contract. It's not about doing the engineering work. It's more about looking for what will be the next contract and the next contract so that you can develop your business. The second business we started a little bit one year later was the uh, beef trips that I started with another colleague who is a professor in the University of Edinburgh as well. And our objective there, our mission was to simplify access to accommodation booking, in particular for Greece. We realized in Greece there are all these rooms to let that are not accessible through the internet. And at the time, 2005, we wanted to make them more accessible to the international uh, clients, something like booking.com that also started at, its, at the same time. I, we were, I, would, I, re I remember looking at the website of booking.com and treating them as competition or thinking about them as competition and look where they are today. I mean, it's a huge company. Everybody's booking accommodation through them, but us um, not. So the lessons learned for the first, from the first company, I would say, Doing business is much more than having a good technical, it's, it's, it's not much more than just about having good technical training. If you want to become a businessman, if you want to succeed in business, you need to know a lot more. Just to give a few examples, you need to know the market rules. We were operating in the uh, Scottish market primarily. So we needed to know how does it work, how to, how to network with companies, how to meet companies, how to get funding from the, from the government and all of this. You need to know the local rules. You need to know accounting. You need to know marketing. And you need to do much, much more than just the technical training. And that is one key message probably for the, for the universities today, that if they want their uh, graduates to succeed in the... Um, in business, in, in our business, they have to be trained in a, a lot more than just the technical knowledge. The second failure um, was basically because we weren't um, prepared, let's say, to quit our day job. So we did like uh, uh, having a constant, a stable salary uh, from the university in that case. I was working in the university. My partner was also a university professor, and it was far too dangerous for us to leave that and go dedicate ourselves to the, to the business. So you need to be a person that can take risks. You need to be prepared to hire people to do the work for you. And that's the only way to multiply your effects. Otherwise, you're simply an employee. Even if you are working for your own company, you're an employee of, of your own company. But if you want to grow and earn, you have to hire people, multiply the effect. These are the two lessons I took at least. But then I had to try more. So my I, I chose to try more in the technology sector, which I felt I knew much better. So I was quite lucky, I would say, because throughout this, this experience, technical experience I had, I worked in pretty much the entire spectrum of power over time. So I, my PhD was obviously on a small power converter in the order of a few kilowatts for radar powering using contactless transfer of energy. This contactless transfer of energy is much more uh, popular, let's say, these days, not just the toothbrush that is charging contactless, but we use contactless for many, many more applications these days. At the time, it was a niche. It was only used in, in satellites, for example, to, to orient the satellite uh, uh, solar panels, for example, uh, and in many military applications, but not in commercial applications. Well, later I moved into different sectors. I worked, uh, my first objective in ABB corporate research was to do the market watch for what was starting at the time. It was 2012, 2009, approximately. And the electric vehicle sector was appearing with a few companies that, that did the first steps. And so uh, ABB asked me to, to do the technology watch for the entire world, which meant I traveled, I, I, did, I went to conferences, I went to China, for example. China was already two, three years ahead of, of us. I mean, I, I visited, they had the Olympic village at the time that was entirely uh, served by electric buses. So I went there, I visited the charging stations, I did uh, some uh, analysis, and I came back to, to report, let's say. So I worked on electric 
vehicles. And then I worked on the flagship product of ABB, which is HVDC. HVDC is high voltage DC, which is used to, to link to distant places, uh, production with a consumption side, let's say. So links that transfer in the order of gigawatts uh, of energy. So, uh, but the most interesting for me as, a, as an engineer, I would say, what I mostly consider that I earned from this experience was the, um, the ability to invent, to invent new things. And this is also what I enjoyed because of my personality. Not, not everybody enjoys this, but I like very much to create new things. And what I consider myself very lucky to have done is these uh, inventions of which I have done several here. Here you can see, for example, two of our patents, world, world patents that uh, have been submitted while I was in ABB. And both of them are now used for ABB products. So I think there is no bigger uh, pride that an engineer can take than seeing your ideas being materialized, implemented in actual products of a company. So that marked the end of an era. So 2012, I took the decision, Sweden is too cold. I have to go to a warmer place. And that was the same, the second time I took this decision because the first was when, while I was in Edinburgh. So I moved with my family. Um, I forgot to say I'm married and I have three kids uh, here in Geneva. So we moved with my family to, to Geneva where I took a place in uh, uh, CERN, the um, nuclear, the the, part, the, the the center laboratory for uh, particle physics. In case you don't know, what we do is we are making big instruments for scientific studies. So we're constructing and running acceler particle accelerators. And particle accelerators are used to make particles smash, collide with one another, and break them down to fundamental particles that we can then study and analyze more. I am not doing that. I'm not that clever to do the physics analysis, but uh, I am part of the teams that are designing the accelerators. And so my first project, um, why I came here, putting together, let's say, the knowledge that I had accumulated until then was to, to run a consolidation project for CERN. And consolidation project is because our accelerators are basically here since the 1953, started to build the first ones. I mean, we have more than six accelerators here. And the accelerators that were already 40, 50 years old needed to be redesigned. And that was my mission when I first came here. And my first one was as a work unit holder. That is where I started to run big projects, let's say. So you take an accelerator, you take a building that is full of power converters or other instruments, and you're redesigning and you are following the project of, of reconstruction of this accelerator. And that is something that can take between four and eight years. In my case, it took eight years actually to finish this, this, these three projects that I'm presenting here. I, I did renovate three transfer lines. Transfer lines are moving particles from one accelerator to the other. And total value of all these projects was probably in the order of 20 millions. Uh, so uh, these 20 million euro concerns the um, the construction work itself or the reconstruction or the renovation of buildings, but also the purchasing of all the equipment for uh, reconstructing the accelerators. And this, in this process, I had to design, I had to do the procurement, which means international tenders. I, we, send, we send our requirements to many companies. We ask them to make offers. We evaluate the offers and then we ass uh, assign the project to one of these companies. And when these companies are ready with pre-series components, we go there and test them. So here are, for example, some of the components that I constructed for my converters or for other uh, colleagues' projects, starting from 10 kV, small transformers. This is specifically, this slide is about magnetics, but this is 
only a small fraction of what we did. So small 10 kilowatt uh, transformers, large water-cooled specialized inductors for current smoothing, transformers in the order of megawatts, very, very challenging stuff where I could also learn a lot because that was not part of my studies, but lots of things you're learning on the, on the job. So this is the final product of what we did, we, I did over the first 10 years of my uh, work there. I will, I hope that the sound will come to you if I play this video, it will take one minute. Can you hear? Uh, Constantinos, when you share your screen in Zoom, you have to tick on the left down corner, share the audio. So please stop sharing, start the sharing again and click also down to the left corner, share the audio. Thank you. Let me do this with sounds. Uh, share sound, yes. Okay. And I would like to welcome also Tatiana to our group. Is it full screen for you? Yes, sir. Go ahead, play. Still, we cannot uh, hear anything, at least myself. No one can hear? What is wrong? Let me try one last thing. And if it doesn't work, I might play it without sound. I mean, anyway, the sound is simply music, right? So it's not, uh, you're not losing anything. I'm gonna uh, explain you. Share sound, okay. So let's try one more time, share. And play. Well, in case you don't hear, this is, this is Sirius, a power converter for particle accelerators. What you see here is many cabinets, one next to the other. I will let it play because it makes a lot of noise here. Right. So that, that is about the Sirius power converter. It's a power converter that we designed here and we purchased in, we, we do not manufacture here, we buy uh, abroad. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, very well. Okay, good. good. Um, so, uh, and uh, it's a power converter. Um, actually, you now saw many, many cabinets, one next to the uh, next to each other, but a, a converter can be made of, a, of a two cabinets up to five up to seven cabinets, sorry. So uh, there are so many of them installed now here at CERN that it takes about 20 seconds, 20 minutes to walk uh, past all of them. And this is the power converter. What is challenging about it, what is special about it is because it's made for physics, physics experiments. The, the whole idea about physics experiments at CERN at least, is that it is reproducible. The experiment has to be reproducible exactly with the same conditions. So the challenge of, for when making this converter is designing a power converter that is so stable that to give you an idea, um, if we use the, for example, gold terms, the precision of this converter, the regulation precision of this converter is equivalent if you were shooting a, a, a golf ball and you hit an ace, so you hit directly in the hole from a 20 kilometer distance, that is the sort of precision it achieves. It's five PPM, five par par parts per million. So anyway, this was the project. So daily life of a power engineer here at CERN, 
you have to do a bit of everything actually because we are small teams and we take care of all aspects of power converters so we start from the conception we do the simulations with the computer we do the design and the drawings of course we have colleagues that specialize in mechanical engineering in in um, technicians we have every kind of uh, engineer here and then of course lots of measurements validation we do a lot of troubleshooting exercises. So we are uh, uh, on call. Uh, for example, myself, I'm on call four times, four weeks per year, 24 hours available, seven days a week. In case of a problem in the accelerator, I will take my car and come fix it. And then we do, of course, the projects. And the projects are, of course, management of teams, international tenders, traveling to industry, validating, verifying, stakeholder relations, because we are in the middle between the physicists and, uh, uh, and the, the, the final product, let's say. So every pressure comes back, back, comes back to us uh, and lots of reporting. And the fun thing is that you can sometimes go to a conference or work with nice colleagues in academia, like I work, for example, on, on, on a PhD project with uh, Jorgos and, uh, and Yanis. Uh, and uh, and of course to supervise uh, yeah locally also PhD students and uh, colleagues. But the message I want to to leave you with is never give up. And I I one of the things I wanted to say is I'm an enth enthusiast about science history. We had a class about science history also at CERN at uh, HMU. I do not recall the name of the professor, but it was a very interesting one. And history of science, I always found fascinating. So I'm when I have free time, I'm digging into the archives of CERN. And I recently found a document, a letter from the director general uh, that was saying, we decided we do not want Van der Meer for our Linux division. Van der Meer was an applicant at the time. I, I don't know how familiar you are with his name. He's, a, he's an engineer. Van der Meer is a, is a Dutch engineer. And the director general was saying at the time, we don't want this guy. Um, he's not good for this division. And this guy, 1984, was the Nobel laureate in physics with CERN. Thankfully, finally, he was with CERN because he invented a method that was called stochastic cooling that led to the discovery of the W and Z bosons. And that was the first Nobel um, that was assigned to a physicist from CERN. So everybody makes mistakes. And just because you got a, a rejection somewhere, it doesn't mean that you cannot make it. Van der Meer made it. Everybody can make it, I believe. So with this, I would like to end my presentation. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you uh, would like to. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Kostadinos, for this excellent first part presentation. I would like to open the floor for questions. I will provide the floor to Aristides, Professor Kiprakis. Please introduce yourself very fast, even though that you were the previous speaker within the series of talks for the rest of the participants. Thank you. The floor is yours, Aristides. Hi, everyone. I'm Aristides Kiprakis. I'm a almost classmate of uh, Costas. I think I was a year major, uh, a year senior to him. What a uh, year, I would say. This, sorry? What a year. Yeah, what yeah, that was a good uh, Vedema. Yeah. <laughs> good year for the uh, for the, the school. Uh, I just wanted to remind him the name of the professor. I think it was Professor Trimandili who was teaching us history of engineering. You're right. I and think that daughter, was and her daughter was studying in Edinburgh just before us, I believe. Good point. Yes, that, right? that's true. True. Yes. Yeah. Just that. I mean, I'm I'm very happy to see um, you again, Costas, and see your work. Um, so yeah, that was all I wanted to say for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. I saw your work uh, a couple of weeks ago during your initiation presentation. I was. Oh, there. did you watch the inaugural? Yes, yes, of course, I was there. <laughs> Good. Excellent. So, Connect. So the floor is to the audience, please, Costandinos. Uh, since we are very a lot of Costas, Costandinos, the speaker, Papa Stergiu, to stop sharing your screen. 
And uh, I would like to open the floor for reflections or questions. I have a couple of them. So I will start. So very, th first of all, you know, I would like to congratulate Constantinos for his excellent work uh, and his excellent presentation, because also your presentation style, it was like excellent in my opinion. I will start with a question um, to, uh, to respond to us. What, since you have worked and you have experience both in industry and also in academia, what are the main differences regarding the requirements and how as universities we can prepare our graduate students to be more ready to perform and be competitive under industry, industrial environment? So what are the main differences that you have identified working in industry and in academia and how the universities can prepare through the curricula and through the pedagogies that we are using in order our graduate students to be more competitive and uh, to demonstrate more resilience under industry, uh, let's say, working conditions. The floor is yours, Constantino. Thank you for this uh, question, uh, Constantinos. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, uh, I, I think that the main advantage, let's say, in a university is that a, a university environment is very forgiving. So it's a very nice place to start your career. It's a very nice place to, to test ideas, to, to fail if you want, to, to, to make uh, research papers, uh, try things, and still um, not really have big consequences. At the same time, I wanted to mention here that it's very, very important for students to not consider the university as a transition uh, simply to, to the, to the um, professional field, but to use the time in university to live as many experiences as they can and mix as much as they can. So what I encourage everybody is to go to other universities is to go to, to, to companies to do like summer summer work. It's super, very important. You cannot imagine how, how much it is important for your future career. The easiest way to find a job is to get into a summer job or to get into a voluntary job, unpaid job or paid job. It doesn't matter, abroad or in Greece or in, other, in the other uh, collaborating universities, countries. So, and why is that? Because everyone would, everybody would like to try you and to test you as a, as a student because they don't take a big risk. They will hire you for a month or two months. They will pay you not so expensive and you have a chance to show how good you are. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. The next one might work. But when you graduate to get your first job, it's a big liability for industry to hire you. So if it doesn't work, uh, they are in trouble. So that's why they prefer to hire people that they have, they have, they have seen uh, in a summer job or in an internship, somebody that they know because the risk they're taking is less. So if I can give an advice is try and do some things while you are students, it's, it's a very enriching process. And that partly answers also the differences between universities and companies, I think. So in a company, when you are there, they are expecting you to deliver something, a product that will contribute to the company's finances. So it's not as forgiving as a university can be, but at the same time, it's also very dynamic. So depending on your character, uh, you can probably choose what you, what you like most. For example, I found very, very enriching the, the competition, the, the, um, um, competition between companies. I was in a, in a field in, in um, uh, DC, high voltage DC transmission, where I would know my direct competitors because they were other scientists from the other side. They would be publishing sometimes in papers, but mostly uh, patent applications. And when I was reading a patent application from a competitor, it was a very exciting time for me because I would like to think and understand how they're thinking. Why are they thinking in a different way? What is it that they, that made them think that way and patent this idea? And this for me was a fascinating thing that you cannot unfortunately do in in in, um, in university not in the same way. It's not so competitive. It's less when you're writing papers and you're trying to publish your research. 
is a little bit less competitive than that naturally. So if you like competition, it, it works better in a company. Um, but other than that, I I think there, there are no significant uh, significant uh, differences, let's say. It's the, the amount of challenge maybe, uh, or the dynamism, and the, the um, <clears throat> comfort that you might have. Thank you, Kostadinos, for a very complete answer. Uh, I will continue with my second one. You can interrupt me whenever you have a question, raise your virtual hand, and then I will stop. For the moment, I will continue, OK? So the second question that I have from you, Kostandinos, I think somehow you have re responded to this question of mine that always I'm asking the people, and um, you demonstrated very clearly. And you mentioned, do not feel, do not, do not afraid to fail. And I totally agree with you because failure is the start of the winning. Either we are talking about sports, football, basketball, or we are talking mm -hmm. about professional development and studies. I would like to ask you and make us more clear, or at least how did you leverage these failures for your future successes? So what did you use from the failures, from these hard, let's say, feelings that we have at the beginning of failure? How did you rebound, let's say? Yes, uh, I, I was in a kind of comfortable situation, in fact, because I had a job while I was trying other things. And so it wasn't so much of a, of a disaster when I failed in the, in the companies, let's say. Um, it was indeed I had talked about my companies or my my what I was trying to do. I, I had talked about it uh, with my family, with friends, and I knew in their eyes I'm gonna be a failure in a way because I didn't manage to to make this company work. But uh, but the bottom line is to answer your question is that I think that what what is the most important is that you understand better yourself, what you like and what you don't like doing. Myself, I knew I didn't like to hunt for contracts. I didn't like to do this part of marketing, uh, trying to sell my capabilities uh, and and trying to get um, and trying to to get new contracts for my business. This was not what interested me. What interested me more was the innovation part. So what I would say, this failure made me understand what I don't like doing and what I'm not good at doing, if you if you wish. So and then I used this in the next uh, steps of my career. Excellent. So will... My next job was really on innovation. Mm -hmm. So I will provide now the floor to Professor Kavoulakis. You always introduce yourself uh, to the colleagues and move uh, continue with your, your question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, at the mechanical engineering department of HMU, although I'm a physicist. First of all, I would also like to congratulate George, you. George, George, he mentioned, you know, the smart people are doing the physics explanation. So you are <laughs> from the smart part of uh, uh, <laughs> point of view. He mentioned Costadinos at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you, what is the next big goal uh, of CERN? As far as I know, it was shut down for quite some time, right? So what is going on there? I'm not in high energy physics, so I'm curious to see what is going on there. Yes, um, look, the CERN is uh, working in cycles. So we have uh, typically three, four years of operation, and then we're usually stopping for a year of upgrades because since this is an experiment, every three, four years we identify changes we need to make to make the instruments more powerful. So we actually came out of a period of four months of a small, a short stop uh, the, because we always stop during Christmas to save energy. This is the main reason because energy is more expensive during Christmas. And at the same time, most of us are international, so we want to go home. So we have found this excuse to, <laughs> to shut down and, and, uh, and make also our upgrades. So we are just coming out of an upgrade period where we, we, we did several uh, improvements, let's say. The, the, the next big goal for the instrument, what we call the LHC, I don't know if you, you're familiar with it, the LHC yeah. is the, the biggest accelerator at CERN, is the 27 kilometer long uh, tunnel that has a, a, a two uh, vacuum pipes in it. And the two vacuum pipes have opposite uh, traveling beams, particle beams, protons. So yeah. at some points, four points around these rings, we make these protons collide 
And when where they collide, the energy is so high that we actually replicate to a certain point conditions of the Big Bang, just after the Big Bang, a few minutes, 10 minutes after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So by doing so, we were able to discover, they were able to discover the, uh, the Higgs boson in 2012. It was the year when I arrived. They, they announced the discovery of Higgs boson and that partially explained the, 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 the gra gravitational field and the gravi gravitational forces between uh, particles. And now the next big challenge is to understand the uh, dark matter and dark energy. This is the first one. So um, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? Well, if we, the mathematicians that study the, the universe, the cosmos, they say that if they take into account the weight of the planets and the position of the planets in the universe, that's not enough to explain why they stay where they are. Mm -hmm. That means there must be gravitational force that comes from something else. And since we don't see this something else, we call this dark matter. But because we don't see it, we don't know where it is, we don't know what it is. So one of the big challenges now is to discover the dark matter, dark energy. Therefore, we are starting also a new experiment, which is called SIP which will focus on this one. And the second thing we're trying to understand, which is also a fundamental problem for us, is why do we have the asymmetry between matter and antimatter? So you know that at some point in time, matter dominated, so everything we have around us is matter, but we are able to produce antimatter. In fact, one of the, of the pioneers of antimatter was uh, uh, Ypsilantis, was a physicist who actually made the first discoveries on antimatter. Just here, actually, the street that is opposite uh, opposite my office is called Ypsilanti Street. It's the Greek mm -hmm. guy that discovered matter. And so the fundamental question is why did antimatter um, vanish, disappeared, and where did it go? And why do we? Uh, why does our universe uh, uh, comprise only of matter at the moment? Maybe these two connections are connect. The questions are connected. So maybe the dark matter and the antimatter question are connected somehow. But anyway, these are the kind of um, answers we are trying to give. Thanks a lot. Very nice stuff. Thank you, know, thank you, Yorgos, for the question and Constantinos for the response. I'm continuing my answers, my questions now, Constantinos. I will stop on what did you say about innovation and what did you like is to innovate. And during your talk, you mentioned that you you were very much inspired to create new things. And this is very important, you know, for the young engineers, I will say for all the of the graduate students and our, and our students. And I think it's like our commitment to develop this instinct. Eh? So I would like to ask your opinion. Did you have it as a talent? Or if you did not have it as a talent, how we should teach our courses in order to develop this instinct to our students? <clears throat> It's a very interesting question, and uh, I, I also uh, asked it myself, so, uh, asked myself several times in the last years because I, in, since I finished these projects that I explained to you, I changed a little bit my direction. Now I'm doing a bit more at the accelerator level, and I'm working on, for example, a project that is called Efficient Particle Accelerators, and I'm working on the next generation of accelerators, uh, but from a more strategic role because. I asked myself the question, do I want to be designing things at the level of component, at the level of device, and so on? Or do I want to be doing something else? And I came back to the same answer that because of my character and because of my personality, I like more to be doing uh, thinking and, and uh, actually uh, inventing stuff or thinking about the future accelerator. So I asked my bosses, can I move a little bit, uh, do something different? And uh, thankfully that was possible. So, uh, but I, to answer your question, I think it's a matter of character to a large extent. Let's say 70% is matter of character and 30% is the conditions and the knowledge you have. Uh, because I see that there are colleagues of mine that really like to do the, the fine design of a component the, the characterization of the component and to really go deep inside. And there are other of us that like to have a more abstract view and do the system design. And I would, I would think my, my character or my personality is more for the second one. 
Now, I think that the knowledge is, of course, fundamental for either of them. So what you learn in the university is very relevant so that you can do both. And in, in fact, the second one, to be more strategic or more abstract, I realize that I'm doing it better as I get, I'm get i getting older because I'm, I'm using my small kind of knowledge or, or understanding of people, knowledge of the components in order to abstract and to be able to think uh, bigger. I agree and disagree in some point, but we don't have time now to disagree. <laughs> I totally believe that, you know, I mean, because we have seen excellent research students that they were not good undergraduate students because, you know, they found someone to inspire them and then, you know, somehow to teach them, you know, to try and fail, even if they don't know, you know, why did they fail, but they keep going. So I agree and disagree, but thank you for your answer. And my, fi my final question to you, that I like it very much, and we try, you know, as a university to, to develop, we have a long way to do, but it's like the civic engagement in CERN. Of course, CERN has a marketing, you know, it's a CERN. It's like a center of knowledge, center of discovery. But um, how, what, is your, what are your suggestions in order the universities to develop what kind of, what are, what, is, what, is, what are your proposals in order to increase the civic engagement of the universities within the society? Um, this is uh, done in, can be done in many different ways uh, because, uh, because of the objectives, let's say, that we have of CERN. One of them is the scientific research, which of course is uh, uh, the fundamental research, in fact, which is very, excuse me, let me stop the telephones. Uh, so what, one, one of the pillars is this. The second pillar is to, to do the procurement purchasing in our member states. So, you know, CERN is made of uh, 20, 30, 23 member states. One of them is Greece. And it's a very interesting, another very, very interesting talk how Greece became one of the founding members of CERN, which I can talk to you about another time. It's history, science history, of course. This is a commitment. We're going to invite you now. <laughs> All right. And uh, so this is the second pillar is about how do we use the industry in member states? So that is also one of our objectives to go and buy from member states. The third objective is actually to transfer knowledge back to the to the countries. And this is done using the, the, um, the various uh, programs, student programs, teacher programs, academics programs that we have. For example, next year, I will have a colleague of, uh, of us uh, from the Norwegian uh, Technical University who will do a sabbatical with, uh, with us in, in our team here. So that is a possibility. You get an exchange uh, pro uh, academic who works here for a year on a, on a real project, let's say, delivering something. And, uh, and of course, the last one is the funding, uh, funding uh, PhD uh, or master, master research that it has to be, of course, relevant to what we do here. So myself, I have uh, I had two PhD students, one just finished and one is uh, ongoing with the Norwegian University again. Um, and uh, so we have the possibility to fund uh, a project if we have some real need, something we want to make. And uh, to extend a little bit the answer, so your first point of contact should be, in my opinion, the country representative. And Greece, or every country member state of, of CERN, has one diplomatic representative, so it's the ambassador of Greece here, and one academic representative, uh, who is Professor Fundas at the moment. He's from uh, University of Ioannina. And so this, uh, for example, academic, uh, his role of this academic uh, representative, he's in the CERN Council, a council that is the administration council of CERN. So he's quite powerful. And he is the one that can initiate uh, collaborations with universities, uh, institutions that are interested. Thank you very much, Konstantinos. I have one more, but you know, I forgot to mention. Yes. You, me you mentioned that you hire people and it's very important for the universities to know how we select our people. So can you give us how do you select the people that they, you would like to work for you? Huh. 
this is a very relative thing because each of us has his own way to to assess people let's say but uh, Constantinos, i'm asking because you have worked for the private in the private if you select the wrong people it's a disaster of the company yeah. I think that the same way we should think as a university so i would like your opinion on this it's a good point but this comes back to what i said before we i i have to tell you i'm rarely picking somebody that i don't know at all that i have no recommendation about him at all. Often, what I, what we're doing is we're getting somebody as a student or a, an intern, and then that could develop to a long-term uh, employment. Um, in a recent uh, employment, for example, I had the recommendation from a professor in Patras, and we hired the person on a two-year contract to 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 see how uh, how what we can do. Uh, this is typical uh, thing, but then, of course, my my personal way is I I talk to the person and uh, I need to understand to feel okay. I I need to feel personally well that I can communicate that I can uh, work with this person for two three years. Uh, that is my starting point, and then is the technical knowledge. For me, the technical knowledge is also something you develop because we are in a such a getting so much specialization these days on everything we do that all we need is a fun foundation and soft skills. Oh, excellent. Key point. Yeah. I will give the floor to, thank you very much, Constantinos, the floor to Ange to Ioannis Angelos Athanasiadis, please. Uh, I'm Ioannis Angelos Athanasiadis. I'm an undergraduate student in the Department of Electronic Engineering at uh, Helen Mediterranean University. I would like to ask, how could I increase my chances of being accepted for an internship at CERN? There is no magic. Uh, there is no magic way. Thank you for your answer. First of all, and your interest. You, I think the 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 straight answer. The competition is high, and the straight answer is you have to try and try and try. You don't give up just because the first time they told you no or you didn't get an answer. So, this is the first thing. You are applying consistently on every round. This can happen two, three times a year, I believe. So you're sending your CV, you're applying consistently until you get noticed, because it's a matter of possibilities. So with so many CVs, it's impossible for me to look, or for any of the colleagues to look for, for the CVs. Now, the second point now, if you're a bit smarter, and if you're a bit uh, more clever or motivated, you can start to look onto the website of CERN and try to identify the teams that have something for you where you could or you would like to contribute or you could contribute. And then once you spotted two or three teams, let's say the electrical engineering team, the vacuum uh, vacuum team, the materials, depending on your science, then you can write an email to the team leader, for example, and say, hey, I'm this guy. I'm so interested for your position. I, you, you will find my CV in the, in the system. That will help you to, you know, just stand up a little bit where everybody else is on the same field. Okay, thank you for your answer. And, I, and I'm assuming that you have a good application, of course. Because yeah, of course, yeah. But because this, your university and your, uh, you know, uh, usually you have an office that can help you write a CV or train you a little bit. So I assume you have a good application. Then you're starting where everybody else is. Okay, thank you again. Uh, Constantinos, we don't have, you know, such a service, but this is a very good idea to develop one. We have some people that are working on how to set up a CV in Heraklion, but I think that this is a very good idea to, to intensify the service and to create such a service. Thank you. Uh, the floor is to our colleague from University of Maribor in Slovenia, Professor Velzer. Uh, thank you, Kostas. Constantinos, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's great uh, following uh, such a great way going through the Europe and uh, uh, landing in uh, such an important institution as is CERN. So uh, congratulations. Uh, I just want to point out that I like your presentation, that I like uh, uh, especially how you're supporting uh, uh, also students. So the failure is just the next start. I agree. Uh, I'm also trying to support my students in the way or my colleagues 
when the paper is not accepted to read it, the comments and uh, start a new paper with that because this is then the next success in one or another way. And I'm just happy that you mentioned also the importance of the soft skills. And uh, 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 as you probably know, or even not, uh, Costas is running uh, already for the second year uh, with uh, Athena partners and others beyond uh, the a kind of soft skill academy very, very easily saying and I see how important is also this for my students so uh, Costas I'm really happy that we are again uh, a part of uh, those activities and my students are looking forward to practical part in Hanya in May. Thank you thank you very much Tatiana and uh, I mean Tatiana for the comment uh, to Costantino's uh, presentation and for our Soft Skills Academy that we have recognized the last three years, you know, the importance of the soft skills to the employability and survival of our students beyond their technical knowledge. And very clearly, Costantinos Papa Steorgiu has mentioned that uh, one of the most important things is like the personal skills of the person when he when he selects, you know, his um, colleagues. I think that uh, if there is no more questions, now it's 5.30, we are here for an hour. Uh, we had a lot of questions, and this shows the success of Costantinos Papa Stegiu uh, talk. The talk is going to be uploaded for the rest of the students to YouTube channel of the Athena European University. I would like to invite Costantinos and Aristides uh, to come as a visitor professor to HMU whenever they want. It's going to be a very high, I would say, uh, honor for our university to call back such a graduate students. And I suspect that Philemonas also is one of them, since I have realized that you are in the same year. And that's why I said, what a year, it's like an all-star game. Uh, it's a year I would like to thank, of course, Professor Kaliakatsos for inspiring these people to move abroad. This is also a very, uh, you know, I mean, he deserves a lot of congratulations for this achievement. Uh, and uh, also, I would like to ask your uh, permission, Costantinos and Aristides, since we have a lot of presentations on abroad, and we would like to brand our university to use your names and your profile as uh, a good examples of our graduate students. A lot of universities they are using their graduate students. In Harvard, they used to say, it's not Harvard, it's the graduate students of Harvard that makes Harvard. Of course, we are HMU, but I think that we have graduates at the level of Harvard, looking at the profile and the achievements of Aristides and Costantinos. So I'm not asking, I'm just from a polite uh, you know, perspective, I'm going to, to use you, to leverage you, not use you. And I would like to thank all of you for your participation. And uh, we are looking- one, one more thing, if I may say, it might be interesting for your graduates. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for every nice word that you said. I'm not sure we deserve all of it, but anyway, it's, uh, it's very nice to hear. Uh, I mean, what, what do you deserve or what you do not deserve is the others that they judge, not ourselves, because <laughs> no? Very nice. But um, also I would like to say that we have, uh, I have an opening uh, a position that's opening uh, right now, I believe one of these days on, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, which might not be directly electronics related, but it's for, for one of our projects that we are starting here. And in the next month, there will be also another position on um, uh, accelerator um, uh, electrical safety aspects. Send us these announcements in order to announce this to the whole university. Yes, the, 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 the place to look for is careers.cern. So there is a website where you can find all these jobs. Excellent. And there you can find jobs for students, uh, technical students at the end of their studies, uh, PhD students, uh, and then what we call graduates. So for the first years following graduation. And the jobs I'm talking about now are graduates. So it's a, a full-time job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much for this. We are going to check it and we're going to announce it at least you know, I mean, through our channels in HMU. Yanis, you would like to close the session? Kaliakatsos, the, the young player. Okay. Uh, I'm very, very proud that I had uh, students like Aristides and Kostadinos, Papa Sergio. And there are also a honor, there is also a honor for me that uh, you accepted finally to 
give uh, the floor to 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 say to us uh, their experience uh, uh, from uh, the first step of studies uh, till uh, their uh, final stage now. I hope that you continue to have a collaboration with our alumni and uh, maybe we'll have the opportunity to uh, take to find other also other uh, graduates from that period that uh, really was the gold age of uh, HMU. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Costas. Yes. Tell okay. me. Please go on, go on. I thought that you finished. No, no, it's uh, it's okay. That uh, thank you very much, Costadino uh, Novostagio. I don't accept. Sorry, Professor. I don't accept that our age was a golden age of HMU. I'm sure that the golden age of HMU is uh, is coming. Uh, this is what I would like to say. To which you know that is coming. Yes. Thank you, Aristides. Thank you. Thank this you. is what I would like to say. You know. So with this, okay. I would like to thank all of you and also my colleague George Leodakis that is responsible as well and contributes a lot for program uh, planning this kind of uh, lectures. We are going to continue. In my opinion, these are the best lectures that universities could have because this is the feedback. What we have done, what we can learn from people that they are on the future because you are in the future for our graduate students and you can work as a as a mentor. So I keep, you know, note, you know, for a new program that we would like to, to run, mentorship, and Papa Sergio and Kiprakis and the other graduate students could play a crucial role for our development. Eh? Uh, of course, for free, because we, are, we believe in volunteer. Eh? So you mentioned this, Costantinos, as well. So thank you very much and see you in two weeks' time. Uh, am I right, George? Uh, I think that uh, although uh, people from other universities are not present. Oh. They have uh, we have the Catholic Easter, so we will continue uh, even okay, before okay, we'll until see, the we'll Orthodox see. one. <laughs> okay, we'll see. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Have a nice evening, and uh, see you Bye. soon. Bye. 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 Bye.